Thank you so much for uh, those kind words, uh, Professor Wayne, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, speak here today and just kind of share with you uh, the high level story of, of what we're trying to do in California um, and you know, hopefully set a stage for a conversation for us. Um, awesome. So as um, uh, Professor Wayne uh, mentioned, I'm going to try and share the story of uh, the clean energy goals of California and within that context, you know, ensuring that, you know, the system is reliable as well as affordable as we um, try to deal with the challenge of climate uncertainty, which is which is completely upon us. Um, and then we're feeling the effects of them, um, you know, continuously since 2020, you know, the, whether it's uh, west-wide heat, uh, wildfires, drought, and so on, and how that impacts the overall energy system. So um, before I jump into the actual content, just want to uh, kind of share with you all. Uh, so the Energy Commission is one of the state's energy policy agency, um, has kind of four key areas of focus, three of which are kind of mentioned here um, in the slide. But just uh, as a way of background, uh, the War Nauquist Act established the Energy Commission in 1974 to respond to the energy crisis of early 1970s, uh, the Cuban um, uh, oil embargo uh, that, that we were uh, kind of dealing with at the time, and just really dealing with the state's unsustainable growing demand for energy resources. So the Energy Commission's efforts, earliest efforts, were obviously in making sure you know, we have energy efficiency in the state so we don't have to build as many uh, power plants that are expensive and seen as environmentally detrimental at that point. And over the last 45 years, since uh, the Energy Commission has uh, uh, come into place, you know, the overall population of California has doubled and the resource mix of, of electricity has drastically changed. Uh, but the energy usage per capita, as most of you probably heard over uh, many years, has stayed nearly constant. And the state has invested billions to advance R&D in clean energy. So three of the uh, bullet points here in terms of setting, building, and appliance energy uh, efficiency standards, that is still a core function of CEC. So CEC has uh, one function, which is a regulatory function that both does the building and appliances standards and codes, but also has um, power plant permitting authority. So that's the regulatory function of CEC. And then we have a planning and policy function. Here it's captured as forecasting uh, electricity demand. So a core function of CEC is to develop common planning assumptions for the state, whether it's a demand forecast, uh, whether it might be uh, what a resource mix could look like in the future. So that sets a stage for the other agencies, sister agencies, to rely on that information as we plan our work. And for a long time, um, CEC has had a function in R&D. And more and more over the last decade, uh, it also has function of D&D. So it's a preferred uh, state agency for investment in clean energy. And one is implicitly captured here, which, which I always think of as the fourth function, is to be the state's data repository. So uh, overall, you know, as things change, you know, the, the kind of core uh, statement or core function that we talk about when we think about Energy Commission is to really uh, the mission of uh, promoting a clean, affordable, and reliable energy supply for all Californians. And, and when we talk about our Californians, We'll touch on that a little bit. Uh, that's that's the primary function of equity, um, and and how equity should be the foundation and prioritization for all decarbonization policies in the state, and kind of really start with under-resourced communities and encourage the market to scale up uh, the necessary solutions. So just again, uh, this is a table setting, level setting slide. Uh, most of you probably have seen this before. Um, you know, this this gets regularly updated, but I think. Uh, thing to just kind of focus here is when we think about decarbonizing California at an economy wide, uh, one of the most important thing to really think about that stands out there is transportation. Um, and transportation is roughly 50% if you take into account parts of the industrial sector that's either refineries or oil and gas operations and such. And you have electricity at about 15%. And then between residential and commercial buildings, you have about 11%. So all those things are of core focus um, as we move forward. And the next slide kind of sets the stage for that. So when we think about decarbonizing the overall economy, um, there are multiple pathways you could take. And since 2018, um, and so there has been 
a general consensus um, amongst uh, policymakers, but also broad stakeholders, that it's going to be one of these four strategies, which is high electrification. So electrify everything you can, while also decarbonizing the electricity sector. Parts of the um, system that cannot be electrified might depend on you know, biofuels for transportation, but also hydrogen uh, for industrial sector. So as we think about decarbonizing, um, you know, one of the things I just want to level set for this discussion is there is a strong consensus that we are going to electrify a large portion of the economy and then decarbonize the electricity sector, and hence you have the net benefit. So as we jump into the electricity sector, I think it's kind of a fun thing to just uh, think about this. If you look at the uh, 1970s mix uh, versus how it looks like now, which is on the right side of the chart, um, you know, we had about a percent of nuclear um, in 1970s, and 60% of our um, electricity came from petroleum. There's a small natural gas, coal, and obviously hydro continues to play a role. But as you look towards the right side of your chart, you know, as we move forward in time, you know, now we have a large portion of solar, uh, wind, you know, we almost have 11,000 megawatts of solar on the system today, and another 10,000 uh, megawatts of solar behind the meter. So you have an uh, incredible amount of uh, solar today. We continue to depend on our hydro uh, for you know, times in the summer when you need uh, that clean uh, resource to help with the peaking of the system. Uh, but then you also have uh, large portions of the wind. And you know, we, we really worked hard on you know, getting rid of all petroleum, but also coal. Um, and then we have a small portion of nuclear today at Diablo Canyon. But I think one of the things that is good to think about is whether we are in 1970s or today, there was always a shared goal um, you know, across you know, the, the people of, of California, which is the energy system should be affordable. It should allow for the economic growth of the, of, of the state. I know we should have energy independence and security. Equity was always a focus. Climate change uh, you know, came along. Uh, in discussions as early as the 1970s and 80s, quality of life, reliability. So some of the core things that we talk about today have always been under consideration with different levels of focus. It's again, just important to note some important um, evolution of uh, in the energy space. The 1970s, you had the oil crisis. Uh, in 1992, we all know the UN framework convention on climate change. Uh, 2000 and uh, 2001, we had you know California's electricity crisis, and then you know recently you know you have the 2021 IPCC report, and and all these things play into the public consciousness and also the policies that we pursue. Um, this might be helpful um, for for those of you kind of just thinking about how the state functions, and there are broadly uh, three key efforts that relate to energy. So one is kind of looking at economy-wide decarbonization, and that's what uh, California Aid Resources Board does through the scoping plan activity. And uh, you know, the, our current goal is carbon neutrality by 2045. And as I mentioned earlier in one of the slides, um, our core strategy is electrification in buildings and transportation as much as we can do, and then clean fuels for transportation and industry, and whatever's left, you know, we pursue through CCS, uh, direct aid capture, national working lands, and such. So that's kind of the overall strategy at an economy-wide. And because so much of it is based on electrification, I, it's vital that we decarbonize the electric grid. And that's where uh, the CEC, the Public Utilities Commission, as well as CARB jointly work on what is called the SB100 effort, uh, which is 100% retail electric sales from zero carbon resources by 2045. So we're basically saying, all electricity retail sales by 2045 should come you know, from zero carbon resources. The flip side of the electricity uh, grid is the gas transition. We had a dual fuel, fuel state you know, for most parts, you know, we use gas a lot, natural gas. And as we continue to electrify, the overall gas demand is gonna reduce. And then you need, really need to think about the reliability standards that we need to think about for this transition but also what market structures and regulation should we deploy. And also thinking about if there is a rapid electrification and how do you reduce the stranded assets and hence the cost to the um, rate payers. 
With that, I'm going to jump into the SB100 portion. As, as I mentioned um, on the previous slide, uh, the SB100 bill, uh, which was signed in 2018, called the Clean Energy Act, um, is basically setting the goal um, that by 2045, the powering of all uh, retail electricity in California has to come from zero carbon resources. And it has this small clause in there which says, state agency electricity needs also should come from uh, zero carbon resources 100%. And uh, second, it, it updates the state's RPS standard uh, to 60%. Uh, by 2030, currently it, it stands at 50%. Uh, so we've been continuously moving forward on this uh, goal. And um, finally, it requires you know, the, the three agencies along with you know, uh, core, um, core stakeholders to write a report on the feasibility, the challenges, and recommendations every four years. So in 2021, the agencies put together the first report, and then 2025, we're going to put, put, put together the next report. So between the intervening years of 21 through 25, what the agencies are doing right now is taking the findings of the report and figuring out how best to implement, um, you know, whether it's permitting, land use, transmission, um, all sorts of um, actual implementation strategies we need to do to make sure that resource build can happen. Just at a, uh, for background, uh, today um, in California, we're approximately 60 to 65% zero carbon already. Uh, we have a large amount of solar and, and wind that we rely on and hydro. And more and more as we move forward, the remaining gas fleet um, are going to be required uh, for a dispatch in the evening. And then we'll talk about that a little bit. The benefits of the 100% policy, you know, obviously in a direct in, in a climate change, but also improves public health. It has a huge chance to uh, improve energy equity, um, especially for disadvantaged communities who have historically paid the burden of dealing with uh, the air pollution, the particulate uh, pollution, and the chance to really electrify and clean um, the communities of concern. And finally, there's a job, there's an opportunity for creating clean jobs. Uh, there's a large amount of resource build that we're talking about, and there's, uh, it comes with it as a large number of jobs. So uh, obviously the 2021 report is a first step in evaluating the challenges and opportunities in implementing SP100. And what I'm gonna share over the next few slides is just a high level uh, summary of some of those opportunities and challenges. So before we go into uh, thinking about um, what tech, you know, how we get there, you know, some of the technologies we are thinking about is anything that is eligible for RPS is eligible for SB100 purposes. So solar, wind, geothermal, you know, some level of bioenergy, uh, and, and then uh, small hydro. But on the top of that, we also added you know, those, those technologies that are zero carbon on site, which includes nuclear, large hydro, and also um, could potentially be fuel cells and other technologies that can be really zero carbon on site. This is a good summary slide. Um, and for, for those of you who are paying, uh, who kind of uh, follow the electricity grid as a whole, you know, we are talking about um, tripling or quadrupling the size of California's electricity grid. And as I mentioned today, we have about you know, 11,000 megawatts of solar. Um, and the SB100 projections uh, that, that we require approximately an, another 70 gigs or 70,000 megawatts of utility scale solar to come online by 2045. Another one that really stands out um, is, the, is the storage. We're looking at about 50 gigawatts of storage uh, to come online and another four, uh, which is uh, for long duration storage that's beyond uh, four hours. And there's a large reliance on wind, uh, both in-state wind, out-of-state wind coming from Wyoming, those um, states and, and regional wind patterns that can help with our load shape. And also offshore wind, there's a huge opportunity in California. Um, there has been a lot of work done uh, with the Department of Defense and the federal government over the last year and a half to really open up the offshore uh, wind conversation in California. And you know, looking towards that, we, we kind of 
put in about 10 gigs of um, available wind and all of that gets picked up. And, and finally, you know, nuclear, uh, we are gonna, you know, the current understanding is to retire it by 2025. So uh, this kind of translates to about three X of, of the pace at which we have been building um, solar and wind and about 8x uh, the speed at which uh, storage is being built. We also explored, as we think through this, you know, one of the questions comes as, you know, if we're electrifying everything, where will the electricity come from? Is it coming from the bulk grid? Or could we uh, really look at optimizing the distribution side of the grid and then really decarbonizing the distribution side and helping it um, support uh, the, the load? One of the things we were not able to do in the first report is really look at different um, DER scenarios or distributed energy re uh, resources scenarios. Uh, but you know, we, in 2025, we look towards uh, developing a few scenarios on that. Uh, but what, what we did though, is like looked at some demand flexibility. Um, if we were to able to shape the demand, how much uh, would that influence the need for resource build? We also looked at some uh, constraint scenarios. Like what if we said no combustion at all? Right. So one of the reasons why there is combustion left um, is when we talk about SP100, it is 100% um, retail sales. So the retail sales portion of the electricity is roughly 95%. So the other 5% uh, of emissions are allowed, which are typically the transmission side, transmission losses and such. So as long as you, um, you know, do not constrain that, there is some level of gas that, that will be um, used to balance the system and you know, make it the most cost-effective system. Uh, similarly, um, there are a number of zero carbon firm resources. For those of you who are tracking, we have long duration storage, a variety of long duration storage technologies. Uh, people are talking about putting uh, modular nuclear um, in, in the Western states uh, and then you know, outside of California. And there are other um, opportunities that that technologies could come up. And so what we did was we looked at generic uh, resources that could offer the attributes of a firm and dispatchable resource and see what happens. So it, and no matter how you look at it, SP100 requires an extremely significant resource build, as I mentioned previously. And you know, in 2045, you know, when you look at the, the high level, you're adding an additional 160,000 in you know, megawatts, so which is a lot, lot, you know, which is huge, and this is not even looking at um, reliability uh, as 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 we look at, you know, I'll talk about it in a few slides. When we look at reliability, the operational way of assessing reliability is much more stringent than a policy uh, report like this. Here's a couple of high level thinking, you know. So if we look at uh, economy wide decarbonization impacts, and then look at different kind of resource requirements, you know, we talked about high biofuels, high hydrogen, and high electrification. You know, as you see here, uh, each one of them has different levels of um, grid sizes that we need. One of the reasons why the hydrogen is higher is because a lot of the hydrogen will be produced using electrolysis. That's the assumption. Uh, similarly, you know, you have differences whether you use offshore wind, out of state wind and such. So that's, there's the slide there. Um, I'll, I'll share the slides with you all, but just kind of interesting to see that as you change the technologies, um, the resource bill changes. So the general understanding is diversity of resources is extremely helpful. And this probably is, is one of the um, uh, critical slides in terms of if we were to have zero carbon dispatchable resources and zero carbon base load that are cost effective, the amount of resource bill that we need to do will significantly reduce. And the reason why we wanna reduce that is the more solar you put on, the more land use it is, and you have to get that land from somewhere. Uh, finally, at a high level, the takeaways, um, you know, the initial analysis suggests that SB100 is actually achievable, technically achievable. Um, construction of clean elect electric uh, generators and storage facilities must be sustained at a record setting pace. And that's, that's really what, what we look at. And then as I mentioned, diversity in energy resources and technologies is really valued in the modeling. The more diverse, the more opportunity you have in, in, in optimizing the system. And uh, finally, there will be some level of retaining natural gas uh, for those 
times when you need rapid dispatch in the evening times. Um, and finally, uh, energy storage and enhancements and, and research would really help. So now that is the 30,000 foot level SP100 25 year time frame. And now let's kind of look into reliability. So most of you uh, probably know that in 2020, uh, we had a load shed event uh, two days in a row, August 14th and August 15th. And those days, you know, we had about a couple of, couple of hours, about half a, a million customers were affected. Um, and, and that's something we really try hard to avoid. You know, we never want to be in a situation where the supply uh, is not adequate. And what, what we really saw in 2020, and I'm going to talk about um, the main reasons you know, that we uh, came up with you know, that kind of really affected our ability to source is extreme heat. The 2020 extreme heat uh, was across the West. The whole of the West felt it at the same time. And so a lot of uh, California's electricity supply relies on imports. So when, when it's hot across the West, there is no imports and hence it becomes much more constrained system. And, and then the demand goes up and then we can only plan for so much demand, right? And I think that's something I'm gonna talk about. We typically plan for, you know, 4% deviation from a median. That's kind of how we think about demand change. But then we were almost seeing 10%, 12% um, uh, kind of departure for the regular demand. And this is just a picture of showing how 2020 was an exceptionally high um, temperature year. Secondly, the, the grid, as you kind of see here, this is an important thing. Uh, when you look at the blue and the, and the orange lines there, the blue line is the actual demand that the system is facing. So as you, as you kind of see there, you know, it kind of peaks in the afternoon, kind of you know, late evening goes down, kind of peaks again. And what you're seeing in, in the orange there is what we call the net demand. What, what it is is that, that it's the total demand minus the solar production minus the wind production. So you're basically removing the intermittent resources. So when you look at that, you know, the right, there is another peak that follows, uh, which is later in the evening. And unfortunately at that peak, uh, you know, if you're relying largely on, on solar, there is no solar to kind of cover that because that's the evening time. That's exactly what we are in, in California. We've had a lot of success in getting a lot of solar online, but having that much solar online means you need to have storage to, to be able to kind of even that out. So uh, this is a summary of 2020, uh, and sorry, it's supposed to say 2020 and 2021 grid conditions, but basically it's just a summary saying we've had a lot of flex alerts, a lot of warnings and a lot of um, emergency situations. 2021 was not as bad uh, because we had more restricted maintenance operations. We were planning better. In 2020, we were caught off guard. Uh, 2021, we were better planned. So you didn't go into the actual emergency states, but still uh, we had a lot of tight conditions. So this is uh, now for those of you who are uh, thinking about getting into this uh, field, what you're seeing here is, you know, we plan 25 years ahead, 10 years ahead, three years ahead, and one year ahead. That's the time, time frames. And as you kind of come closer and closer in time period, you know, you just understand the demand better, your supply assumptions are better and so on. So overall, you know that state of play a little bit better. But so let's start off uh, at the high level, which is the climate goal timeline, which is the 25 year timeline. Typically what we do in reliability is you, you look at the demand, Again, demand is, it's a scenario, it's not a forecast. You're thinking about multiple scenarios. You, you pick a demand scenario and you say, I'm going to construct an optimized low cost or, the, or most cost effective resource build, meaning whatever resources I need to bring online to meet that demand. And when we think about reliability, we plan the reliability of the, the, the current industry practice, which is as long as the system is reliable, to give you statistically one less than one outage every 10 years, you're good. That's kind of what how we plan. And you move into 10 years, the planning is very similar. It's still kind of dependent on what, what we call the loss of load expectation of one outage every 10 years. But here you have the demand forecast instead of the demand scenario. You have a much better sense 
of, of what the forecast could look like, the demands could look like. And this is where you actually authorize procurement. So you basically say, okay, this is the 10 year ahead. Let's make sure we actually procure resources to meet that based on the best available technologies today. And then come this one to three year paradigm, which is the resource adequacy paradigm where you're making sure, okay, now that I procured or authorized procurement, meaning building new steel in the ground, uh, you know, do I have enough of them under contract? That's what you see there. And finally, in the year ahead timeframe since 2020, what we have been doing is what we call the contingency planning. Given that climate change is upon us and it's hard to really uh, get a sense of that, we are really putting some risk margins and figuring out if it were to hit extreme climate, do we have enough contingencies in our pocket to drastically reduce the demand or bring up supply? So I'm gonna skip this slide, but this is basically a summary of the emergency proclamation. The reason why I put it here is it just gives you the kind of things we do. You know, we, we look at increasing generator limits. We look at thinking about permitting uh, faster and, and those kind of stuff. So, so finally, I think one thing I wanna leave from here, the lessons from 21, 2020 and 2021, demand side management is critical, which is at the bottom. Reliability and, and equity are, are key to clean energy transition. If we don't have a reliable system, people would not believe that clean energy transition is feasible. Um, and on the, on the equity part, if we don't plan well, and then we need to have emergency resources, those emergency resources like backup generators and such are usually present in, at, in a communities of concern. And that's what we depend on and it's completely inequitable. So just kind of going into the 2023, 2026 timeframe, which is a midterm timeframe, Based on all this, uh, the Public Utilities Commission has authorized in a building of 25,000 megawatts of new uh, resources over the next you know, three to five years, which is you know, this really big step towards SP100 and also a big step towards relying more and more on storage. Um, for a long time, storage used to play the role of ancillary services and more and more what we saw in 21 um, is that they're actually helping shape the load, which is, which is phenomenal. And I want to end a little bit with the governor's budget and where um, you know we're going. Uh, so the governor um, has you know either you know the legislature has either granted funding or the governor's budget currently has about four billion dollars um, in clean energy funding, and that's going to go through CEC. And as you see there, about two billion is going to go towards clean energy, clean transportation, broadly infrastructure, uh, chargers and such, and also the for hydrogen. And on the other side, uh, it's uh, another two billion is for uh, the clean energy transition, including um, long duration storage and such. So out of the 1.8 billion, which is the second bucket, so a billion is going towards decarbonizing buildings. And it could be weatherization of buildings in communities of concern um, to electrification. And then there's a, a large amount of money for long duration storage projects. You know, those which are on the cusp of being commercialized, but just a little bit too expensive. Green hydrogen grants, industrial decarbonization is, is very important. That's something we don't have strong policies on yet. And then really thinking about it. And a lot of money uh, for both uh, the food processing industry, but offshore wind as well. So these are the priorities that gives you a sense when you look at the budget proposals. So I just wanna end with this and then hopefully uh, we can jump into some questions. Uh, so we talked about, you know, just kind of setting the level, um, kind of going back and, and summarizing the slide deck, the story I wanted to share was, you know, as we think through the energy transition, we wanna start with economy-wide thinking and the economy-wide thinking, um, you know, the general consensus today is to really electrify large portions of our economy where we can electrify, including light duty vehicles, um, residential buildings, commercial buildings, and then really think about for those sectors that are hard to electrify, how do we develop clean molecules? And if we can develop those clean molecules, how do we use CCS and other you know, natural uh, processes to really help um, sequestrate that? So within that electrification strategy, the importance comes on decarbonizing the electric grid, and we have a 25 year plan um, on, and then we think it's feasible to really meet the electric the clean energy goals of California. But doing that, you know, reliably is important. Otherwise we lose the confidence of, of people as a whole. And then 
because we are going through this climate change uh, situation, it's really hard to predict the, the volatility, the demand and the supply situation. And that's something we are really focused on right now. And at this point have what we call a contingency plan. And, and hopefully as we get more and more data, historical data, we plan better and better moving forward. But no matter how we go, uh, a significant portion of the strategy as we electrify and, and, and decarbonize the electric grid is storage and being able to have those um, zero carbon dispatchable and firm resources that can quickly dispatch, that can um, really follow the shape of the load, especially in the, in the evening timeframe. As we talk through all of that, I just want to end with this particular one, which is ensuring equity. So as we think through this transition, um, we have to pay incredible attention to um, the equity. Um, you know, I think most of us uh, know and we strongly uh, believe and, and, and kind of want to fight for, you know, the, in, in an equitable transition that all Californians can be a part of this journey. And a part of that is recognizing the incredible disproportionate burden that has been put on communities of concern for a very long time. And how do we make sure those inequities do not continue, right? So I think what, what we need to focus on, some of the key things that come up through our community engagement is really thinking about that, you know, how do we tackle, um, you know, the air quality issues and water quality issues specifically in communities of concern and, and rapidly. Um, another thing that comes up is procedural equity. Um, not everybody has a chance to be at the table. Um, and a lot of times the communities of concern um, have you know, low resources or do not have the necessary resources, the funding or the financial backing to be at the table. And, and that is a huge loss uh, in being able to get their perspective, but also have their voice in the way we shape the future. And affordability and energy burden is important. As we electrify, uh, one of the challenges is, you know, we need to make sure um, that we don't have any stranded costs, um, and hence, you know, you know, impact the affordability, and that's a that's a huge huge part of a uh, in a puzzle. And the Public Utilities Commission, their fundamental focus is on rates and affordability, so they have a huge role in doing that, and they have a couple of proceedings going on right now. The other part is um, non-energy benefits. A lot of times, when we optimize system. We don't. We only optimize it for some cost. We don't look at uh, tackling, you know, the non-energy benefits as air quality, water quality. How do we, you know, put them in there as, as a way of modeling, some way of to quantifying them, and also ensuring that you know the access and participation in the clean energy programs are available for everybody. For example, as we electrify uh, the residential buildings, so a lot of uh, there's a lot of infrastructure, gas infrastructure, that will continue to stay, right? So, and that infrastructure, if you're not electrifying um, low-income um, customers, those low-income customers who cannot electrify will then be stuck with an extremely large distribution network that they have to pay for. And, and that that is just not equitable, that's just not fair, and how do you do that, right? So how do you make sure that electrification programs are accessible, uh, to um, uh, low-income households, as well as disadvantaged communities and communities of concern. And they have an opportunity to be a part of um, creating this clean economic pie. And also the benefits are shared. And so with all that, um, you know, the IEPR, IEPR is the Integrated Energy Policy Report that CEC publishes every year. So this year, one of our core focuses is to develop an equity framework for all CEC programs. You know, what are some of the tools, metrics to assess equity and be really accountable and be um, intentional about all the work we do. And also creating that framework for regional engagement so that there is increased procedural equity. So that's, that's the story I wanted to share with you all. I'm happy to take uh, any questions as we move forward. Thank you. So much, uh, Commissioner Gunda. That was very, it sort of course, it's very wonderful to have a presentation on first thing to come. Uh, thank you very much. So, do we have any questions in the room? We'll probably use the mic for those. Yeah, I'm just going to apologize. We're going to keep our um, video off for the privacy of the students, but we'll, hopefully, you can hear us. Uh, thank you so much for your thought, Commissioner. Um, one question I had was related to biopower. Um, so SB 100 uh, doesn't give a lot of consideration to biopower, which makes sense given the non-combustion goal you have mentioned. 
However, if you look into the public commentary of CC documents, biomass alliances usually come in saying biopower is better, releases um, you know, less emissions compared to the alternatives of having wildfires or just having open burning in the Sierras, for example, for its biomass. Um, so I was wondering, what is your take on the role of biopower in the future, given its uh, wildfire uh, benefits or reduced wildfire benefits? And then a second question was just a very short one. Uh, when I was wondering when you mentioned the high biofuel scenario, what did that imply? Did it imply imported biofuels, energy crops, uh, did it rely a lot on renewable natural gas? If you could just tell more about that scenario. Yeah, absolutely. Ex ex excellent questions. Thank you. Uh, so first, uh, tackling the bioenergy, I think you know you you've actually uh, really summarized. Uh, some of the perspectives. Um, so I think there's there's a few things. One is you know the currently um, there is you know economic value for certain communities uh, to not only kind of support the the, the wildfires issues but also support energy uh, from those. Right. So th that's kind of currently in our modeling we continue to put them in. The reason why um, it doesn't necessarily get picked up right away in modeling is at least at this point, it's a little bit expensive than alternatives. So, but to your point, I think it's it's important to create a pathway for the bio waste. And, and if, there's, if the opportunity is really to um, have localized generation that can support local grid, I think that's, that's you know, I, I think it's beneficial. And then we need to kind of like think through the optimal solution there. The second element that um, you know you, you probably mentioned in there, but I, I uh, maybe not as explicitly, um, there is um, SB uh, 1383, uh, which is a bill that requires, for example, 75% of all organic material uh, from from waste to be converted uh, to um, you know, to be to be used in biogesters and and potentially convert to energy uh, slash biochar and stuff like that. So. That I think is a humongous opportunity. Um, at a high level, it is approximately um, six, six to eight billion dollars investment um, that could uh, produce significant amount of RNG uh, to be put in the pipelines. And then CPUC uh, recently had uh, an RNG um, kind of prescription for injection standards, so which is which is great. But then also to be able to island facilities like wastewater facilities where they're co-located and, and also has the opportunity to potentially produce hydrogen and other um, uh, energy carriers. And as you mentioned, uh, uh, rightfully, it's a negative carbon. Um, it could be negative carbon, given that uh, much of the biogas is typically um, just burnt on location or are sometimes just uh, leaked. So I think those are excellent points. Uh, those we are thinking through uh, those. Uh, we have at CEC a proceeding uh, on gas transition, and one of the things we are hoping to tackle is that particular thing. So I know there was more questions than that um, on that one. Uh, sorry if I didn't tackle all of them. Uh, happy to take a follow-up question. Hi, thank you, Commissioner. Um, I wanted to ask who's in charge of like making sure that these policies get implemented at the local level in terms of all the proposed climate solutions, there's money for these projects. Um, does it come down to like who's asking for project bids? Who's in charge of that component? Um, are, are you thinking specifically about um, the new generation? Yeah, it could be anything from new generation to ensuring that all of the vehicles are zero emissions by 2030. I'm just very curious about how the policy gets trickled down into the actual implementation and whether these policies, like, can we ensure that they will be met? Yeah, absolutely. So local governments and local entities are, are critical uh, for, for kind of having any of the policies uh, really, you know, come to fruition. And I think the most important um, part there is most of the local governments and uh, communities is where, the, where actually the action happens. So the, the kind of 10,000 foot level, uh, just kind of taking the electricity sector first and then maybe transportation next, for example, electricity sector, when we think about um, 
the, the high level goals, the way it trickles down um, from a high level policy is, you know, within the policy landscape, you're thinking about um, what resource mix need to be procured for each load serving entity. And some of these load serving entities could be CCAs. Some of them could be large IOUs. And those CCAs then have the, the kind of a role to both need to require, like to meet the standards, but oftentimes they exceed the standards. Um, those, those, are the, um, com those are the CCAs that are uh, really uh, close to the communities and then thinking through, um, uh, so usually tend to exceed those. So I think from an electricity side, what happens is um, the CARB uh, kind of which sets the high level greenhouse emission goals for each sector kind of sets the uh, high level um, a need or like, you know, the, the emissions target for a sector. And then that is, you know, basically divvied up to different load serving entities, whether those are CCAs, large utilities, uh, whether they are direct taxes. And then once you have those, um, the procurement is done um, based on, you know, whether you know, if it's a, a regulated entity like uh, the IOUs, uh, the investor -owned utilities, they come with their plans to the CPUC, you know, get their permissions and so on. But if it is, you know, a non-regulated entity, then the entities can, you know, have their own local boards where they think through, you know, their, their goals and then, you know, do uh, implement there. So that's kind of how the electricity system plays out. For transportation, uh, I'm a little less uh, knowledgeable about, uh, about exactly how the transportation plays out, but, it, but what I know is, you know, the, there is something called um, the integrated resource plans. And the integrated resource plans have not only um, the elect electricity side of the goals, but also the goals for electrification. And those goals generally are laid out by local uh, entities, again, LSCs, um, are, are uh, publicly owned utilities, and then um, implemented from, from there. So I think the, the way it goes is, again, in summary, policy at a high level, some, some high level kind of constraints on sector-wide emissions. And then, you know, it kind of really comes to bear at the local level and the funding then it, it's, you know, to the extent that we have funding, it really needs to be done in a stakeholder process where you're doing those competitive solicitations to support, you know, ideas across the entire state. Thank you so much. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, Nigeria, you asked one question. Um, so I know uh, there are a variety of uh, assembly bills, uh, Senate bills, which have, which support, uh, which has uh, financial incentives or uh, which gives financial incentives or tax incentives to promote, uh, for example, investment on uh, renewable energy or energy storage. Um, on the other hand, there is a say, kind of a variety of Senate, uh, kind, kind of bills to, ha to have the kind of a procurement mandate about uh, specific, uh, for example, some utility companies need to say, procure uh, energy storage of a specific uh, capacity exhibit or something. Um, so that's that's my question is uh, how to balance uh, such kind of a procurement mandate and the financial tax incentives. So is there a better idea or how to balance that? Uh, I really uh, I really appreciate if you could share some okay, knowledge or information. Yeah, absolutely. So I think you know there's there's two elements to that. Um, so one, and I'm just kind of starting from the planning and then implementation and procurement. So at a planning level, uh, just at a thirty thousand foot level, I think it's extremely important to have a regulatory certainty. Um, so I think regulatory certainty helps with you know markets really um, providing solutions. You know whether they are technologies or or other other innovations, financial in innovations that really allows for a clear signal on what is needed for the market. So this is where the integrated resource planning really plays an important role. Um, so when you are kind of doing this 10 year, 15 year planning, uh, whether it be on the resource mix or transmission needs and so on, it really gives you a clear signal that by so-and-so date, uh, you would need you know, long duration storage. And without long duration storage, you cannot really meet the goals that are set by, you know, the the Air Resources Board and then PUC or any other, um, you know, a regulatory entity or you know, or a POU. So once you have those, I think that the market signals really helps with that. Second, I think you know, even though there is market signal, 
and are sometimes they are too expensive. Um, and, and so, for example, the budget that the governor put together, uh, the 380 million for long duration storage is really a recognition of that, which is there are a lot of long duration storage technologies that we currently have beyond lithium ion, right? So lithium ion is typically four hours. Um, you could take it to up to six, uh, but really once you cross that six hour mark, you're really looking at um, other technologies. Um, and, and when you're looking at them when they're not ready to be commercialized because they're too expensive, um, that, that kind of budget element is really to subsidize them, you know, to subsidize the, the initial commercialization. And, you know, hopefully the, the regulatory certainty um, and the initial, uh, you know, kind of incentives or subsidies to deploy these technologies will, and, and then kind of having that opportunity for scaling really does allow a number of uh, solutions to be innovated in the marketplace. And that's, that's kind of how we approach that. Um, Heather, uh, my, my question is about um, the, the commission's outlook on the future of, of hydropower. Um, given that in the past couple of years, uh, capacity for hydro has been pretty significantly diminished due to drought. And it seems like it's relatively reasonable to assume that similar conditions may continue for the next 10, 10 20 years. Um, I'd love if you could walk us through uh, how the commission sort of views uh, large scale hydro um, and, and what you're planning to sort of uh, meet the meet, meet the gap um, as, as hydro capacity continues to, to fall. Yeah, absolutely. So um, you're absolutely right. Um, I think it's a, it's a really good observation. Um, in 2020, um, you know, we had in a decent hydro uh, levels, but in 2021, you know, as, as you are alluding to, you know, the Orville Dam, for example, we uh, did not have any generation for the first time since its construction. So what we are doing in the in the in both the near term, extremely near term, which is the year or like few years ahead, and the long term is really looking at a broad hydro D rate. Um, so part of it is, uh, part of the difficulty right now is we do not have the historical um, precedent for a lot of what we are observing right now. So when we model it, um, kind of creating the scenarios uh, and, and then the reduction in hydro, you know, we just don't have the history uh, yet because it could be even worse than what we're seeing today. Um, but to the extent that the history is available, to the extent that uh, inputs are uh, vetted amongst uh, stakeholders and there is reasonableness, we bake that into the resource planning. And, and a large amount of, of hydro, hydro is this um, dispatchable resource, right? You could really ramp up or down. So as there is lower and lower levels of hydro, um, that, that means you, know, you will need more and more dispatchable resources. And, and that comes out of our assumptions that hydro um, drought conditions are gonna per persist and then hydro levels are not gonna be at the same levels as we've seen historically. It also um, does another thing, which is we have a large amount of uh, imports that we depend on um, and especially from the Northwest hydro. And that's something we are watching as well. Uh, and that will really change the equation on how many imports that we can depend on, not just the hydro, but also as the rest of the West begins to decarbonize their own states and their electricity grids. That means they won't have enough resources for a while to really uh, support um, you know, California uh, at certain times, right? So it's important, uh, it's an important problem. Uh, we are paying attention to it. We're trying to model it and, and you know, really thinking about other ways to have those dispatchable resources in the evening period and summer periods. With that, a couple of final questions from the online audience. I'm going to combine a large number of questions. So the first one has to do with different um, kind of uh, supply options in, uh, that people didn't detect uh, in in your talk. So I don't know if it's in the plan or in the planning that I'm asking about because you're kind of going back and forth because you're in charge of not just having a plan one year, but what to do uh, in subsequent years. So where does CO2 capture and storage, distributed energy, and hydrogen fuel cells fit in to the plan and the planning from your point of view. Yeah, absolutely. So um, let's start with uh, fuel cells and hydrogen. Um, so in this particular, uh, for 2022, the Integrated Energy Policy Report, one of the specific things we called out is hydrogen. Um, so 
there is a large amount of uh, federal funding um, on hydrogen, um, as, as some of you might be tracking, and there is opportunities for um, four hydrogen hubs um, across the across the country. And so, you know, I think a, a lot of people in California, you know, a lot of uh, groups together, uh, really are pursuing that. There is opportunities for hydrogen um, in large industrial sectors and and the valley. In, in, in LA, there is some opportunity in Sacramento area. There's also opportunity in Bay Area uh, where you have you know, large, large industrial loads. So overall, I think, um, you know, I wanna be mindful on how, how I kind of speak here, which is, you know, there's a personal view and then there is kind of overall public policy view, uh, which kind of continues to emerge. I think based on the data we currently have, there, there will be, you know, at, at least to the extent that I've observed the data, there is need for clean molecules. And you know, when we talk about clean molecules, then you know, th so the, the immediate things are you either have, you know, the options are hydrogen or RNG with CCS and, and others. So I think the discussion right now is how much do you need them? That's one. And there's a bunch of modeling that's being done to assess the amount of need for clean molecules. The second thing then is how do you um, take the clean molecules to where it's needed? Uh, do you need large infrastructure for these clean molecules? For example, with hydrogen, um, the current pipelines that we have for, for gas will not be readily um, usable for hydrogen uh, because, because of the embrittlement issues, but also the hydrogen being a small. So the question then becomes how do we um, think about whether what levels of it is distributed hydrogen um, and, and natural gas, for example, uh, or the RNG, as we talked about with the biodigesters idea, and what part of it is actually going to be in a core backbone infrastructure system. So I think it's an important question. Um, I think it's an important question. It's a very timely question, and we have efforts both at the state level, uh, you know, multiple agencies coordinating to figure out, you know, some roadmaps and some options for RNG. Uh, options for uh, hydrogen as well as CCS. So overall, um, those are a bucket of uh, options that I think of as, as clean fuels options and, and definitely in the works. So one final question. Uh, this has to do with, um, should you, could you, uh, do you need to include climate damages in your total uh, resource plan? Piece. I, there's even a legal question in there, but I'm sure you're used to getting this question. So uh, how do you think about such things? The, the fact that uh, fossil fuel combustion causes, uh, that uh, land use emissions causes climate damage. Yeah, absolutely. I think you know, that's kind of one of the things I had on my very last slide is that non-energy benefits uh, question. And then it's, which is the flip side of the, you know, how do we, um, you know, value or put a monetary value on the cost of carbon. So there are some levels of cost of carbon that most modelings use today. Um, but I think, you know, how do you really say it's, it's a true cost? And I think there's a lot of debate on how to value that. I mean, personally, I feel, um, you know, as, as, you know, we have had an, an inequitable uh, system. So I think I, I do not... I, I deeply believe in doing this together. We're all in this together. Um, so there is, you know, the the California, um, you know, growth of California has has been largely reliant on, um, you know, fossil energy generation. And I think so. I I personally feel, you know, you don't, um, you know, forget that. So right. So there, there is that element. Um, but then as we transition, we do not want to, you know, we want to have a place where everybody has jobs. But at the same time, we don't forget the inequities that have been done on certain communities of concern and how do you value that? So it's, it's a legal question. It's, an, it's a moral and ethical question. It's a fairness question. And I personally hope that we can come up with metrics that really help value the damage and really um, create a fair and equitable system. Uh, with that said, uh, thank you so much for a great talk and in particular for answering each and every question so thoughtfully and comprehensively. We really appreciate it and we're looking for great things from the Energy Commission and the State of California. Thank you very much. Thank you.